Have you ever been lost before? Have you ever wondered how you would ever find your way back home? The challenges of life can be disorienting, and it's all too easy to take a wrong turn or to get stranded along the way. It can be daunting to get back on track. We all experience distance from God, whether we stray from Him for minutes or decades. We all know what it feels like to be lost, far away from God. But God doesn't want to be separated from us for even a moment. In Pastor Andrew Lynch's upcoming sermon series, Lost and Found, The Joy of Restoration, we'll look at three of Jesus' parables, each a snapshot of God as he searches tirelessly for the lost. And each time, we'll see that God welcomes back what was lost, not with shame, but with love, rejoicing, and restoration. Join us May 16th and 23rd with in-person services at 8, 9, 30, and 11, and online broadcast at 9.30 a.m. at newhopechurch.net. All right, well, good morning, everybody, and welcome again to New Hope. My name is Andrew, and I'm one of the pastors here, and it's so exciting to be with you here this morning, and I get to share with you from God's Word. And so today, we are going to be starting a new sermon series called Lost and Found. And so over the next two weeks, we will be looking at a few of Jesus' parables in the Gospel of Luke, and each one gives us a snapshot of God and His heart for restoration. And so if you've got your bulletin, we have some sermon notes in the bulletin today if you would like to follow along and take notes that way. And so the other day I was driving with my boys in the back seat and it was one of those moments when they were just asking me like every question that popped into their heads. And we've got I've got two boys, Elijah is 10 and Samuel is 9 and Samuel's our little guy that just never runs out of questions to ask. And inevitably, this line of questioning always ends in what the boys called the olden days, which is way back when I was a kid. <laughs> and from their perspective, if you think about it, they're not wrong. Like, things are very different now than they were even that many years ago when I was a kid. Like, it's amazing how quickly things change. But the thing that they have the hardest time wrapping their heads around is that we didn't have cell phones back in the olden days, right? And so we watch these movies, and they see what you and I would, would, would call a phone. And, and they ask, Dad, what is that thing that they're talking into? And, and it's just pretty funny how quickly everything changes. They have a hard time imagining a world where a phone is connected to your house and, and isn't in your pocket going with you everywhere that you go. And so one of the questions that they've asked me lately is, Dad, why do we say hang up the phone? <laughs> Have you thought about that lately? <laughs> Isn't it funny how our, our language doesn't evolve as quickly as our technology does? And so I had to explain to them, well, when you're done talking on the phone back then in the olden days, you didn't just tap a button on, on the screen. You actually had to hang the receiver up on the hook on the wall. That's why we say hang up the phone. And the the examples and the list goes on and on. My kids have also never lived in a world without GPS. Have you ever thought about that? We live in a world where it is increasingly difficult to get lost. If I have a cell phone connection, I can be guided to any place that I want to go. And, and it's... It's amazing because I was thinking about it the other day, and I, I don't know about you, but I can't remember the last time that I was driving that I didn't know where I was. And these kids are missing out on so much in their lives. Like, they've never been lost on the road before. Like, they're missing out on these precious childhood moments, like it's sitting in the back seat and sitting very quietly while mom and dad argue in the front seat about whether or not to stop and get directions. Right? <laughs> And so as I was preparing for this sermon series, I, I was asking myself, wondering, I wonder if my boys even know what it's like to be lost. And then I remembered the thing that nearly all kids experience, and that's getting lost in the grocery store. And I don't know about you, but I have vivid memories from my childhood of getting separated from my mom in the grocery store. And it pretty much always started the same way. We would be going down one of the aisles and I would see something that I really wanted and I would pick it up and I would look at it. And my mom would immediately say, we are not getting that. And she would keep moving on. But I would stand there and I would look at this thing. It was usually a toy and I would focus on it. I would examine it. And when I was done looking at it, I would put it back 
And then I would look up, and my mom was nowhere to be found. And for a kid, that is a moment of just sheer terror. And so I was always a crier. I don't know about you guys. So I, I ended up running around the store, like crying, sniffling, trying to hold it all together, searching for my mom until I found her, her or until mercifully some other mom adopted me on her shopping cart, and I got to hold on to it until we found my mom. And it doesn't matter if it's separation from your parent in the grocery store or driving around in circles lost or losing the path in a forest. The feeling of being lost is at the very least disheartening. But at times, it can be downright terrifying. And that's just being lost in the literal sense. How much more are those feelings amplified when we're no longer talking about being physically lost, but when we're talking about being spiritually lost? And so over the next two weeks, we're going to be talking a lot about being lost and being found as we look at these parables of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. And so Jesus uses this lost and found language because it's something that we can all identify with. But the parables that we're going to look at today, they give us the perspective of God. Not the perspective of the one who's lost, but the perspective of the one who searches for and finds what is lost. And so today we're going to see that God is overjoyed when the lost are found. So let's open up our Bibles to Luke chapter 15, and which is where we'll be spending our time today. And so the first two verses of this passage give us the context for the parables that Jesus is about to, to speak. And this is what it says in verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so our passage today opens up with this small explanation of what was going on. Jesus was essentially hanging out with the wrong people, and the Pharisees did not like it very much. They were passing judgment on him. And so we basically see this picture of three groups. We have Jesus on one side, we have the Pharisees and the teachers of the law on the other side, and in the middle we have the sinners and the tax collectors. But notice which way the sinners and tax collectors go. It says that they were all gathering around to hear Jesus. They weren't gathering around the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the religious elite. They had all of this political power. They, were, they weren't gathering around the teachers of the law, the ones who really should have been guiding these people to God. Instead, they were drawn to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they did not like that very much. And so they muttered, this man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. But the thing is, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, what they had done is they had built this wall between themselves and these so-called sinners because they thought that if they hung out with these people, if they associated with them, that it would jeopardize their own righteousness. And so what we see here is that where the Pharisees built a wall, Jesus set a table. And so the Pharisees, they couldn't possibly hang out with these tax collectors. Like these tax collectors were traitors. They were getting money, these taxes, from their own people and shipping it off to the Roman Empire. They're taking this precious resource from Israel and giving it to Caesar. At the very least, they were viewed as corrupt or immoral, and they were ostracized because of it. And then on the other hand, we have these sinners, and they were also viewed as outcasts because they were viewed as unclean. And there were hundreds of ways that a person could be made unclean, like having an illness or eating the wrong food or coming into contact with the wrong kind of animal or eating with other people who were unclean. And so what do the Pharisees say that Jesus is doing with these people? Eating with them. Okay, so if they were unclean and Jesus is eating with them, what does that make Jesus? Jesus. Unclean, right? And so surely the Pharisees thought Jesus is going to refute this. There's no way that he could let us call him unclean. And sure enough, Jesus does refute their accusation, but not in the way that we would expect him to. And so we see at the outset of this passage that we have three groups. There are the, the so-called sinners, and on one side, we have the Pharisees that are distancing themselves from them. And then on the other side, we have Jesus who is welcoming them into fellowship. And to explain his actions, to justify himself, he tells three parables, two of which we'll look at today, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the next Sunday, we're going to look at the longer parable of the lost son. And so let's read that first parable today. This is starting in verse 3. It says, 
Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. And I tell you, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So he says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and he loses one. That's the picture that Jesus is painting in the minds of the Pharisees. And this wouldn't have been hard for them to imagine. Like a shepherd with his sheep was a really common occurrence. In fact, they may have even had one in their line of sight while Jesus was telling this parable. And even though it wasn't hard for them to imagine, Jesus was trying to get them to imagine themselves in the shoes of the shepherd. And so this sheep and shepherd theme is one of the most prevalent in all of the Bible. And and in Scripture, we have these beautiful images like Psalm 23, where God is our shepherd and he provides for our every need and desire with his loving kindness. And it's really easy for us to romanticize these images and think to ourselves, you know what, I would be such a good sheep. I would never wander away from my shepherd. I would listen to everything he says. I wouldn't get stuck. I wouldn't fall away. But... When you think about this image, God uses the image of sheep on purpose. Like, when Scripture compares us to sheep, it's not a compliment, okay? (laughs) Sheep aren't particularly smart. They have to be supervised constantly. They really have no way of protecting themselves against predators, and they have this tendency to wander off on their own and get lost or stuck places, right? And so that's the image that God uses for us, sheep. And when we're being honest with ourselves, we realize that all of that's true, right? Especially when we compare ourselves to God. Like, we're not really that smart. We're constantly in need of God's intervention in our lives. We're susceptible to being attacked in a million different ways. And we also have this tendency to wander off on our own. And so left to our own devices, we're a lot like this little sheep that went viral recently. Sometimes we find ourselves in a trench, and, and God's got to pull us out. And when he does, we have this newfound freedom and this excitement. And what do we do? We jump right back in that trench, don't we? Have you ever felt like that sheep before? It's okay to admit it. Like, it's actually very appropriate for us to imagine ourselves as that sheep. Like, we should be humbled when we compare ourselves to God. And in the same way, we shouldn't shy away from this label sinner that the Pharisees were using as an insult and a weapon. And the Pharisees, you see, they didn't have any humility at all. Their, their problem, in fact, was precisely that they didn't recognize their own sinfulness, yet they called out the sinfulness of others. They considered themselves to be the shepherds, not those dumb, dirty sheep. And Jesus turns the tables on them. And he says, suppose one of you loses one of your 100 sheep. What would you do? And so clearly, he's presenting the one sheep as the sinners with which the Pharisees do not want to associate. And he says, if one from your flock went missing, what would you do? And the the answer is obvious. You would go search for it. Even a bad shepherd would go in search of a missing sheep, even if it was just for economic reasons, because sheep were money makers for their owners. And so this rhetorical question gets asked with with the answer already embedded in it. In verse 4, Jesus says, doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And the answer is, yes, of course he does. But here's where the story takes a twist, and we see that Jesus is describing the heart of God for the lost. In verse 5, it says, And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. And so maybe you've heard this parable enough time that enough times that this reaction seems normal to you, but think about it. If you lost one of your 100 sheep and then you found it, 
Would you get everybody together and then throw a party? I wouldn't. I think back to when I was, I had one dog in my life that was like my dog that I had since she was a puppy, and I loved that dog. And when I was in high school, that dog went missing. And so I searched the neighborhood, and I put up posters, and eventually somebody called me and said, I found her, she's safe. And I was so relieved. But you know what I didn't do? I didn't get all my friends together and throw a party. What I did is I put that dog in the backyard and said, don't do that again, right? And that was for a beloved dog a beloved pet, but here we see one of 100 sheep. Like, a normal shepherd wouldn't care that much about any given sheep. Like, they were sheep, right? They were interchangeable. But our shepherd, God, is not a normal shepherd. His sheep are not interchangeable. His sheep are precious, and our shepherd doesn't want even a single sheep to be lost. Our shepherd's unashamed. And he delights in the finding. He delights in being reunited with his sheep. And when he does, he is so overwhelmed with joy that he has to share that happiness with everyone that he can find. That's our shepherd. And so Jesus finishes the parable with this explanation in verse 7. He says, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need to repent. He says, you think that shepherd's celebration is unreasonable? Well, then you're not going to like heaven very much because this is exactly what it's like, this type of rejoicing, any time a sinner repents. And that brings us back to our main point for today, which is God is overjoyed when the lost are found. God is overjoyed when the lost are found. And so without a break in the actions, Jesus continues and he jumps right into that second parable and has the same exact structure as the first one. And he says in verse 8, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and she loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And so again, we have this, this other rhetorical question, and this time about a woman and her 10 coins. And on the surface, it seems pretty straightforward. There are 10 coins, one of them is missing. But the coins being described here aren't just any coins. So when a Jewish, Jewish girl, back in the real olden days, would get married, she had this like bridal headband or headdress that looked a lot like this. And she would wear that during the wedding, but also she would continue to wear that after the wedding as a symbol that she was married. So this, this headdress was essentially um, the equivalent of a wedding ring. And they were adorned with these silver coins, each one of which was worth a day's wages. And so these headdresses basically acted as, as a, a, a little dowry or an insurance policy, a safety net, just in case a woman would become widowed. And so Jesus doesn't detail the woman's situation, but the options are pretty clear. We know for sure that she has lost a precious piece of what is essentially her wedding ring, and, and possibly she has lost a tenth of what is her like insurance policy, and her only savings. And so it's obvious, Jesus says. He says, doesn't she light a lamp and sweep the house and search for it until it's found? And the answer is, of course she does. What else would she do? And so one thing that really strikes me about these parables is that they give us the perspective of God, the perspective of the one who has lost something precious, not the perspective of the one that's lost. And in each one, Jesus says, and when he finds the sheep, and when she finds the coin. You see, when God searches for what is lost, he is not satisfied until he finds what he's looking for. Because to God, Every single person is precious. Every single coin is worth searching for. And Jesus chose his words carefully. He says when, not if. And this is a beautiful picture of God because it shows us that God is confident in his ability to find those who are lost. And it strikes me that it's, it's a lot like being back in the grocery store. Like when you're a kid and you're lost in that grocery store, it's a terrifying moment but when you're the parent, it's a completely different experience, right? And I got to experience this recently with my little guys in, in Walmart. And so one day, Elijah and Samuel and I were in Walmart, and we had just finished paying. And somewhere between the register and the door, Samuel decided to veer off and go check all of the vending machines to see if they had coins in the change thing, right? <laughs> 
And, and so I noticed immediately that he, had, that he had walked off, but I figured he was going to follow pretty quickly, and so Elijah and I kept going. But by the time Samuel was done, we were like 50 yards away, clear on the other side of the store. And I thought to myself, you know, I knew, I, I knew the whole time that he was gone, but from my perspective, Samuel was never lost. Like, was he out of reach? Yes. Was he out of sight? For some of the time, yeah. Was he out of earshot? Yeah, unless I wanted to yell across Walmart. But from my perspective, I had never lost my son. But that was not at all what Samuel experienced. And even from all the way across the store, I could see the panic visibly set into his body. And I knew from experience exactly what that felt like. He was feeling like he was completely separated from safety and protection, just utterly lost. But from my perspective, he was retrievable in about 10 seconds. And think about how much more powerful of a father God is than I am. Think about how much more capable God is of retrieving those who are lost. No matter how lost a person can get, they are never out of God's reach. Not only is God capable of finding those who are lost, he is confident in his ability to do so. And so Jesus finishes the parable saying in verse 9, and when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. And so we see the same exact ending to this story about the lost sheep, or the lost coin, as we did the lost sheep. This totally unreasonable celebration, like a gathering of friends and neighbors because she found a coin, right? And, and keep in mind that these coins were the equivalent of a day's wage. So like to give that some, some reference, a day's wage, maybe $15 an hour, an eight hour shift, that's $120, okay? How much money would you have to spend to get all of your friends together to have a celebration? Okay? The whole point is that this is totally unreasonable. Think about it. Like, hey, everybody, let's spend some money to celebrate that I, that I lost this money and now it's no longer lost. Like, that doesn't make any sense. The whole point is that this is completely unreasonable, even wasteful that you would celebrate this sort of thing. And then Jesus explains it and he says, in the same way, this is verse 10, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And so he finishes up these pair of parables with the same explanation. When a sinner repents, it is cause for celebration. But let's not forget how this scene started. Where did we start with this? What was Jesus doing? He was welcoming sinners and tax collectors, and he was eating with them, right? Sounds a little bit like something that we read in the parables, right? The shepherd and the woman, they both had gathered their, their friends and their neighbors together to celebrate, to rejoice. And Jesus is literally gathering the lost to himself, rejoicing. And when the Pharisees see this, what do they do? They grumble, right? And they accuse him. This man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. And so now we can see Jesus' response even more clearly based on these parables. And Jesus might as well have said to them, like, just like the shepherd, just like the woman, rejoice with me. What was lost is now found. Can't you see that these sinners are repenting and they are returning to God, being reconciled to him? That's the whole point. That's what he was saying to the teachers of the law, that God is overjoyed when the lost are found. And there's this implied question back to the Pharisees. And that question is, why aren't you rejoicing too? And so these short parables tell us an awful lot about the heart of God and his desire to seek and save the lost. And it would be tempting to make these parables say even more than, than they actually do and draw some extra conclusions about salvation from them. But the biggest question that this parable, these parables bring up that we need to answer is, does this mean that everyone will be saved? Because Jesus uses this absolute language, right? In both parables, they seek until they find the sheep, until they find the coin. And the finding is also never in question. It's, Jesus says when the sheep is found, when the coin is found, not if. But that doesn't mean that every person in the world will be saved. And that's because God doesn't force anyone to come to him. Each person has to decide for themselves whether or not to put their faith in Jesus. 
And so how do we understand this parable then? And I think to answer the question, what does it mean to be lost, is very helpful in this passage. And so the answer comes by understanding what it means to be found in this passage. So two times, in verse 7 and 10, Jesus compares being found to a sinner repenting. And so, quite simply, found equals repentant, therefore lost equals unrepentant. And repentance doesn't need to be overcomplicated either. Repentance is literally to change your mind or to turn around and go the other direction. And so I think the easiest way for us to think about this today is that repentance is turning from sin to God. And Romans 10.9 says this about repentance and salvation. It says, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is a picture of salvation, to declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. When you declare that Jesus is the Lord of your life, you do that over and against all other things that are vying for your allegiance. And when we truly declare that Jesus is Lord, that means that we are changing our mind about the sin in our life. That's repentance. It means that we are turning around and going the other way from the things in our lives that want us to put our trust in them instead of God. That's repentance. That is to make Jesus the Lord of our lives. And so when a person repents and they put their faith in Jesus for the very first time, that's when God gives them the gift of salvation. And that happens once and only once in a person's life. But is that the last time that that person needs to repent? No, of course not. Think about your own life. How often do you need to repent of something, to change your mind or to turn around and leave behind something that has drawn you away from God? I know for me it's often. Any time that I recognize that sin in my life is drawing me away from God, I confess that to God and I return my allegiance to him. And sometimes I can recognize that quickly, but other times it takes God a little while to break through my stubbornness and my hard-headedness But here's the great news, you guys. God is delighted in our repentance. We've all experienced the feeling of being distant from God. And maybe it's that you've never known him. Or maybe you've been keeping him at a distance for years. Or maybe along the way you've strayed here and there. However long you have strayed, whether it's for five minutes or for decades, it's too long for God. God doesn't want to be separated from you for even a moment. And so the question remains, Who can be lost then? And the answer is anyone who's unrepentant. And so if you've never repented and given given your your life to Christ, then, then you're lost. But in the same way, if you have trusted in Jesus, if you have repented and received salvation, but today you are unrepentant, you are just like that sheep wandering off in the wilderness. You're lost. And when we do that, we're not looking to God to guide our lives and to meet our every need and desire. You know, I wish our our reactions were more like that kids in the grocery store. Like, what if the very moment we realized that we were lost, that we searched frantically for God, desperate to be reunited with him? And think about that kid. That kid is never for a second doubting that he will be welcomed back with open arms. That's what God wants from us for us to repent and be restored. And so that's our first application point today, to repent, return, and be restored. And so if you ever find yourself lost, return to God. And you don't have to be worried about his reaction to you either. When one sinner repents, it says, just one, there is great rejoicing in heaven. One sinner, that's you, that's me, that's any one of us in this room. And Really, we are all sinners, and the only reason that any of us could ever be considered righteous is because we have faith in Jesus, who died in our place to take away our sins so that we would no longer be separated from God. And so when you feel far away from God, remind yourself, preach to yourself, say, God is overjoyed when I return to him. Even if it's just one step that you've taken in the wrong direction, you can immediately turn back to God, and God is overjoyed when you turn back. And I think we all know how to recognize the sin in our lives. It usually starts in our hearts and in our minds, and and we can recognize it in our thoughts. Maybe we're bitter or angry or envious, 
Or maybe our thoughts get fixated on things and we fall into the temptation of thinking that that thing or that person could make my life better. Or maybe we discover that there's hatred in our heart at times. Whatever it is, whatever we allow to fester and multiply in our hearts, eventually that is going to make its way out in our words and our actions. And so begin training your mind to turn immediately to God, and he will rejoice in your return. No condemnation, no shame, just love and rejoicing and acceptance. But these truths don't just apply to our individual lives. They also apply to our corporate life together as a body of believers that we call New Hope Community Church. And we see the Pharisees and the teachers of the law in this passage these are the, the religious leaders, the, one, the ones whose job it is to lead people to the Lord. And instead, we see them, they have shaped the minds of these people to think in terms of insiders and outsiders, right? And over and over again in the Gospels, we see Jesus poking holes in this bad, bad theology. And Jesus is always telling them it's not the insiders. In fact, it's usually the outcasts who are the ones who have the most sincere faith in the Lord, the, uh, <clears throat> the ones who are most willing to sacrifice for the Lord. And in fact, they were the ones who first recognized that Jesus was the Son of God, way before the religious people ever did. But the Pharisees and the, the teachers of the law, they ostracized them instead. And it's really no surprise after all, because what were the Pharisees known for? They were known for putting barriers between people and God. And just a few chapters earlier, Jesus says this in Luke eleven forty six. 46. He says, and you experts in the law, woe to you because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry. And you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. You know, there's a lot of people that have had that same kind of experience of church, like judgmental, rigid, legalistic, have you ever felt that burden, burden of religion? Like, do these things, don't do these things, don't hang out with those people. That's not what God wants from us. God wants us to reflect his heart to the world. God wants us to recognize that there is no difference between any of us when it comes to deserving his grace. In fact, none of us deserve God's grace. So when we draw these lines and we say these people belong here but these people don't, we are going against the heart of God. And instead, there are two things that we should do. And the first thing is to recognize that we are all sinners. When we come to church, when we gather as a church, this is a place where we are meant to recognize that each and every one of us is a sinner. The only way that we could even consider ourselves righteous is because God has deemed us righteous through faith. And the second thing that we can do is that we can rejoice with God over any sinner who repents, any lost person who is found. After all, how often do we need to repent? All the time, right? Every single day? How could we possibly judge somebody else? How could we look down on someone else because of their sin? Instead, we can rejoice any time we see somebody repenting and coming back to the Lord. And so we live in this world where it is increasingly difficult to get lost in a physical, spatial sense. But we live in a world where it is just as easy as it has ever been to become lost spiritually, to get disoriented, to lose our focus on God. But God doesn't leave us alone, and that's precisely why he sent his son Jesus because God can't stand the thought of any one of us, of you or me or anyone being lost. And so he sent his son Jesus to this earth to live a perfect life for us and to die in our place so that we no longer have to be separated from God by our sins. And so if you haven't made that decision to repent and put your faith in Jesus before, why not do that today? And there's no, there's no magic prayer. What the scripture says is if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. And if you are already saved, God's feeling towards you is still exactly the same. He doesn't want to be separated from you for even a moment. So imagine if you and I could take those times 
when we recognize that sin has drawn us away from God. And instead of feeling defeated or unworthy or insecure, instead of wondering if God is angry at me or if he's disappointed in me, what if we could remind ourselves that God knows us far better than we even know ourselves? What if we could recognize in those moments that we feel lost, that God actually knows exactly where we are and in fact has already started to work to bring us back to him? And what if we could remind ourselves that that God is there waiting for us, not just waiting, but waiting to rejoice with us when we return to him and we repent, whether it's for the very first time or for the 50,000th time. That is the God who loves us. That is the God who is overjoyed when the lost are found. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you that while we were still sinners, you died for us. Lord, you look down and you can't stand being separated from us for even a moment because you love us so much. And it's amazing to think about, God. We, we have nothing to compare in this world to the kind of love that you have for us. God, we pray that we would cling to you, that we would focus on you, and that we would be willing to return to you any time that we sense that we're lost, any time that we drift away due to sin. God, I pray for anyone in this room today who, who hasn't put their trust in you for the first time, anyone who is, is sensing your love right now for the very first time in their lives, I pray, Lord, that you would overwhelm them with your love, draw them to you, God, your word says that if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that you raised him from the dead, that, that a person will be saved. And God, I pray that you would save those that you love this morning. God, we thank you that we can return to you with, with no strings attached. God, every single time we repent of our sins, Lord, you are elated. And we thank you for that. Help us to remember that no matter how lost we feel, you know exactly where we are. Help us to remember that you are always on the lookout, always waiting for us so that we can return to you, our God with open arms. God, we pray that as a church that we would remember that each and every one of us is a sinner and that there is nothing that makes us any better than anyone else. God, I pray that you would give us eyes to, to see and ears to hear how we, how we interact in the world and that we would spread your love in everything that we do, every action, every word. And I pray, Lord, that, that, that we wouldn't build any walls like the Pharisees did, but we would set a table for fellowship with those who might not feel like they are worthy of your love, those that might be forced out God, I pray that we would show them your love because you have shown that love to us first. God, we thank you for this day and we thank you so much that you are here with us. Be with us as we go out into our everyday lives and help us be your light in this world. We love you so much and we thank you for this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, well, thank you so much for being here today and we'll see you back here next week. God bless. Well, thank you so much, worship team. That was awesome. And hello, everyone. How are we doing today? Good. good. All right. My name is Andrew, and I'm one of the pastors here. It's so good to be with you here this morning. I wanted to start off today with a little bit of a game, okay? So I've been working at a church for my entire adult life, and what I've noticed over the years is that you guys tend to leave a lot of stuff behind when you leave this place, okay? And so Church Lost and Founds, they tend to get pretty full, and they tend to get full of a lot of the same stuff. So let's play a little game this morning. Let's play Guess What's in the Lost and Found, okay? What do you guys think? What do you think are the common things that get left behind? What was that? Sweaters. That was real quick. That's a mom over there, okay? There's, if, especially in children's ministry, there's going to be jackets and sweaters all over the place in there. What else? Okay, we've got a Bible. That's right. What else? Sunglasses. Any sort of glasses, really. I've got, actually, where did I go? Did I smush them? Anyway, there's glasses in here somewhere. There they are. Glasses, right? Reading glasses, sunglasses, any kind of glasses. You guys like to leave your glasses behind. What else? Okay, phones. People usually come back for their phones. <laughs> what else do you think? Um, 
Water bottles or a coffee mug, perhaps. Okay, and then my favorite of the bunch that's a little bit rarer around here and a little bit more seasonal, but umbrellas, okay? You guys have really good intentions bringing umbrellas to church, but it doesn't rain, and then you leave them in the pew. And then, a fun fact about me, every umbrella that I've ever owned in my life has come from a church lost and found, okay? (laughs) And so, if you see me walking around with an umbrella that looks an awful lot like yours, it's probably because you left it here. And so the reason I bring this up is because as humans, we have this in common. We all lose things. And sometimes we lose things because of carelessness. Sometimes we lose things because our memory fails us and we we just don't remember where we left something. And sometimes we never, ever figure out where it was or how it was that we misplaced something. And most of the time, it's something inconsequential like a coffee mug or reading glasses. But sometimes it's the thing that's missing is something that we cannot live without. And that happens to be the case in the parable that we're going to be looking at today. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 15. And so if you want to open up your Bibles to Luke 15, and you can also follow along in the bulletin. We've got sermon notes in the bulletin today. And so last week we went over the the first two parables in Luke chapter 15, and we saw this picture of our God who is not satisfied with one sheep or one coin, one person being lost. And we discovered that God is overjoyed when the lost are found. And so today we're going to look at the third parable in, the, in Luke chapter 15, where Jesus gives us an even more descriptive picture of a father who longs for his wayward son to come home. And so last week we talked about what it felt like to be lost, like this feeling of helplessness that comes from disorientation, from being separated from, from safety and security, not being able to find your way back. But today we're going to see things from a different perspective, and we all know what it's like to lose something. Have you ever lost something, misplaced something, and wonder to yourself, man, I wonder where that thing can be? Think about, though, how those feelings are different when that thing that is missing is not just a thing, but it's actually your child. And some of you, unfortunately, don't even have to imagine that. You know exactly what it feels like. And so today we're going to read one of Jesus' most well-known parables, the parable of the lost son, sometimes called the prodigal son. And today we're going to see that the riches of repentance far outweigh this so-called sweetness of sin. And so before we read the parable, I want to rewind back to the opening scene of this chapter in Luke 15 so that we understand the context, the reason why Jesus is saying these parables. And this is how the chapter opens in verse 1. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they were basically accusing Jesus of associating with the wrong people. The Pharisees, they wanted to distance themselves from these sinners and they wanted Jesus to do the same thing. But what we see Jesus doing is actually welcoming them, accepting them, bringing them into fellowship, eating with them. And the Pharisees didn't like that very much and so they muttered, This man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. That's what they accuse Jesus of. And Jesus says, yep, that's exactly what I'm doing and here's why. And so he tells these three parables, two we looked at last week where we discovered that God is overjoyed when the lost are found. And today we're going to look at the third parable, the grand finale. And here's the first half of the story. You can read along starting in verse 11. It says, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and I'll go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father.'" 
And so Jesus continues this progression through these triplet parables. And we see in the first one, it starts with a shepherd with a hundred sheep and one is missing. And then in the second one, we see a woman with ten coins. Also one is missing. But in this third parable, we see the most precious example yet, a father with just two sons. And the younger son then asks his father for his share of the inheritance of the estate, right? So right off the bat, this should strike us as abnormal. Their estates were a little bit different back then than they are now, but this request, which would be extremely rude in our culture, would have been even more offensive in their time and place. Because when do kids usually get their inheritance from their parents? When their parents die, right? And so this young son is basically saying to his dad, you know, dad, I could really use this money, and since you're not dead yet, can I have it now? Put yourself in the shoes of that father. How would you react? Now put yourself in the shoes of the, of the older brother. What would you think of your younger brother's request? Like it would be natural for both of them to be angry and to be offended by this, right? Because what the younger son wanted is he wanted the riches of his father without a relationship with him. And so Jesus begins this parable by describing this preposterous request. And, and we know what happens next. We already read it. It simply says, so he divided his property between them. And so in Jesus' time, wealth was almost completely wrapped up in property. And, and we see in the Old Testament that the, the wealth of the patriarchs was described almost entirely by how much livestock they had, how much land they owned, how many servants they were able to support and manage. And so when the father here divides his estate, he's providing an inheritance, not of currency, but of property. So he's giving la- livestock some land as well. And there's no indication here that the father's uh, really afraid that his son is going to go and immediately squander this, his share. But it's good news to both the father and to the son that in Jewish culture, the eldest son, the firstborn, actually got a double share of, of the inheritance. And so what they're giving this younger son is actually just one-third of the family fortune, which means that the father and this older son can continue to live off of two-thirds. It's still this massive amount of money that we are that we're seeing this son inherit, but it's not quite half of the family fortune. But not long after that, Jesus says, the younger son set off for a distant land. You know, it didn't take him very long to figure out what he was going to do with that wealth that he inherited. It says that not long after he received it, he gathered up everything he had and he set off. And where was his destination? A distant land, right? far away from his father, out of his sight, and away from his influence. And so last week, we talked about this this feeling of being disoriented, this feeling of being on your own, this distance from God, this feeling of being away from safety and protection. And that sort of feeling is a result of unintentional distance, like a sheep wandering off or a coin being misplaced. But in the parables of the, the sheep and the lost coin, when, when those things go missing, the woman and the shepherd, they meticulously search for them as soon as they realize that they're missing. But what we see in the parable of the lost son is a very different picture. There is a distinction in this distancing. The younger son sets off for a distant land. Like this was his plan. He was purposely putting distance between himself and and his father, and presumably the the whole rest of his family and the community. So we can't be exactly sure what his motivation was for doing this, but we know what he spent his time doing when he was there. He was living a wild life. And so it seems to me like this son had some things in his mind that he wanted to do, and he knew that he couldn't do them around his father. And so he went away so that he could do all of these things without anybody that he knew, without his father anybody from home finding out. And so he fell into this temptation thinking that he could go be someone else, that he could live this new and exciting life. And this distance that he experienced is very different. It didn't frighten him. He wasn't lost. In fact, this was his plan. He felt empowered. He was independent, kind of like that first time getting behind the wheel after you get your driver's license. This was a totally different kind of distance than we see in those first two parables. This distance 
is deliberate and defiant. Have you ever felt like you could do better on your own? Like God was too restrictive and wasn't letting you live the life that you wanted to live? You know that saying that it's the oldest trick in the book? Well, this idea that we would be better off without God is literally the oldest trick in the book. Rewind all the way back to the beginning of God's relationship with humanity. In Genesis chapter 3, we see Eve having a conversation with this serpent. And in the midst of their chat, we see that Eve, in fact, correctly understood God's command to her and her husband. God had given Adam and Eve this entire garden full of, of trees and fruit to eat from. And he said, there's one tree that you are not allowed to eat from. And if you do, there will be consequences. You will surely die. And here's how that played out. Genesis 3, starting in verse 6. It says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked, and so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And so even though God warned them, God told them exactly what was going to happen, somehow Adam and Eve didn't realize that their disobedience would lead to death. And not just death for themselves, but for every human who would come after them. And they, they were deceived. They ate this forbidden fruit because it was so enticing. It was pleasing to the eye. It was good for food. But the sweetness of that fruit didn't compare at all to the heartache that it brought. They learned a tough lesson that day, and that's that the sweetness of sin always turns bitter. And that's exactly what we see with the younger son. It was in pursuit of this wild way of life, a life that he couldn't live at home with his father, that he squandered his wealth. Verse 14 says that he spent everything, his entire inheritance, and then there was a severe famine. And so that's about as bad a situation as you can imagine. He's already spent his entire fortune, and now even the most basic necessities of life are in the highest demand. And so it seems like an understatement then <clears throat> when Jesus says in verse 14 that he began to be in need because he had invested every penny he had in that wild living, and it didn't pay even a single dividend. He was broke he was in need. The sweetness of that wild living wore off real quick. The sweetness of sin always turns bitter. And so in verse 15, we see how he responds to this situation. It says, so he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the field to feed pigs. And so this young man, he went from being on top of the world to being so low that his only option was to hire himself out as an indentured servant. And what did he get put in charge of? Pigs. Okay, pigs were one of those unclean animals that the Jewish people were not allowed to, to come into any contact with, let alone eat their meat. And here he is. He had reached such a low point in his life that all he had left, he had no other choice but to be a servant taking care of detestable animals. And believe it or not, it actually gets worse from there, okay? Verse 16 tells us that he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Can you imagine that? Like, this is rock bottom. He was so hungry that he longed for the food that the pigs were eating. And the, fam the famine made even that more difficult. Think about it. If you have a herd of animals that part of what they eat is food scraps and food is scarce, then that means that pig food is scarce too. And so this owner of this, these pigs, the guy that, that this younger son is working for, he basically says, I don't have any pig food to spare. He basically says, I value the lives of my, my pigs more than the life of my servant. Can you imagine that? And so after all that this young man had gone through, this is where he ends up. And we see a picture here of what distance from God produces. Like separation from God will always, always let you down. Just like in the Garden of Eden, sin has nothing to offer except for empty promises. And so this young man thought that he was going to live, to live it up, to live the high life, and instead he found himself lower on the totem pole 
than a pig. And so there he is at rock bottom. And in verse 17, it says, when he came to his senses, he thought of home. So he thought of his father. He compared that situation to his own situation. And he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. And he finally recognizes that this distance from God, this pursuit of wild living, it wasn't going to end just in embarrassment. It was going to end in death. After all, that's what all sin leads to, right? Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. And so it took him starving to finally realize that he'd made a mistake. And what we see in verses 18 and 19 are the only clear thinking that we see from him so far. This is what it says. It says, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so we see this first glimpse of, of his heart beginning to change, to think about, about going back to his father. And this shows us that returning begins in our hearts. And there's three parts to it in this story today. The first thing that the son says is that he's going to go back. This is a picture of repentance. Last week we talked about the definition of lost in these parables, and we, we discovered that lost equals unrepentant, and therefore found equals repentant. And so when he decides to return, that's his first act of repentance. And next, he makes up his mind to, to say to his father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. That's an example of confession. And the third thing he says is, I am no longer worthy to be your son. And so we see this humility from the son for the first time, this recognition that he had made a mistake by, by cashing out his inheritance, making such a selfish decision. And he's absolutely right when he says that he's no longer able to be called a son. Like every right and privilege that he had as a son, he had, he had given up. He had already cashed that chip in when he asked for his inheritance early. And now he had only one thing on his mind, only one option left that he could think of. He was going to go home and he was going to ask his dad, make me like one of your hired servants. You know, it wouldn't be this glamorous life that he had hoped for, but at least he would have food to eat. At least he would have a place to sleep. And that was his hope. That was his hope when he came to his senses. And in verse 20, it says that he got up and he went to his father. And this is what happens next. But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And so in verse 20, we see the heart of the father. And a, a lot has been made of the reaction of the father throughout the course of church history. But here we see just how much this father was hoping that his son would return. And this image is in stark contrast to the two parables that we read last week where the shepherd and the woman, they searched meticulously. They searched until they found what they had lost. But what we see here is not a father who, who went looking. He didn't go searching, but instead he waited, hoping that his son would come home. He kept an eye out every day. How else could we explain that he saw his son when he was still a long way away? And you might wonder, why, why are these parables so different? Like if the father loved his son so much, why didn't he go search for him? And the answer is, because unlike that sheep and unlike that coin, the son was not unintentionally lost. He was deliberately putting distance between himself and his father. He was determined to live a life independent of God, of his dad. You know, we talked a little bit about this last week, that God doesn't force anyone to come to him. Each person has to decide for themselves to come to God. And so, and so we see this picture where this, 
where this, this father is waiting for, for his son. And this shows us that even, though, even those who are purposely putting distance between themselves and God, those people are still very much on God's heart and mind. He's always on the lookout for the first sign of anyone changing their heart, their willingness to come home. And in fact, he's ready to receive them when they decide to come home. And so we see in verse 20 that this father, when he saw his son, he was overwhelmed with compassion, and he ran to him. And he threw his arms around him, and he gave him a kiss. So think about how well parents know their children. Like, we see this picture of a man who sees a person walking up the road to his property, to his house. And certainly this had happened before. It happened since the son was gone. But he didn't just run out to anybody, right? He recognized his son, have you ever noticed how well parents know their kids? How well their parents can pick their kids out of a crowd? I can pick my kids out of a mob of children from a long distance. And it's because I know them so well. It's not because, because I set out to do that. It's because I have spent so much time with them that, that I just know what they're like. I can tell from a distance because I know how they walk. I know their subtle movements. From a distance, I can tell if they're happy or sad or angry just based on their body language. Think about how much more in intimately God knows you and me. And so from a long way off, this father immediately recognizes his son. This isn't just any person walking up to his house. This is his son. This is the moment that he's been hoping for and praying for. And his reaction is one of sheer unashamed love. He runs to his son. He embraces him. He kisses him. And after they embrace, the son says all of the things that he had set his mind to say to his dad. He repents. He confesses. He has humility. He tells his dad, I'm not worthy to be called your son. But the father doesn't let him say even another word. Remember, there was still one more thing that he was going to say to his dad. He was going to say, Dad, take me back as one of your hired servants. But the father had already heard enough. And he responds to his son's confession, his acknowledgement that he isn't worthy like this. Verse 22, but the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. And so the father wasted no time whatsoever. Clearly, he had thought this through. He already knew exactly what he was going to do when his son decided to come back. So let's review the details of the instructions that he gave to his, his servants because each detail shows us that this father wasn't just throwing a run-of-the-mill celebration. He was pulling out all the stops. This was a celebration of the highest order. First, he says, bring the best robe. This was a robe that would have been set aside for the guest of honor, and presumably the robe that the father himself would have worn if he was the host of the party. And then what we're seeing here is, is more and more the father is making it clear, a clear distinction that he's bringing this son back, not as a servant, but still as a beloved son. And so the ring and the sandals, that's another, another sign that he was being fully accepted back into the family, and then the fattened calf is slaughtered, the fanciest, most expensive thing that they could serve their guests. Did you guys know that there are restaurants all over the world that are competing with each other today to, to create the, the world's most expensive dish? Do you know there's people out there that want to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on like the most decadent food, and the, the pricier the better. Did you guys know that there's such thing as a $25,000 taco? Okay, this is what it looks like. I'm not even sure that it looks that good, okay? This dish, it, it starts with a corn tortilla that is speckled with 24 karat gold, okay? It's filled with Kobe beef, shrimp, black truffle brie cheese, and almas beluga caviar, which I found out is the rarest caviar in the entire world. And then it looks like, I don't know what all that stuff is on top, but some of it's gold too, and apparently you're supposed to eat it. And so 
Would you eat a $25,000 taco? I don't think I would. But what if you showed up to a party where you could have as many $25,000 tacos as you wanted to eat? It, it, this, this fattened calf wasn't exactly that decadent. It wasn't as, as exorbitantly expensive, but it was the fanciest meal that you could prepare for your guests. And think about how big a calf is, okay? You could feed a lot of people with a calf. This was a real party. This was not a small thing. And so the father gave this explanation for why he was going to the, such lengths for his son. And he says, this son of mine was dead, and now he's alive. He was lost, and now he's found. This father, he could have chosen to dwell on the past. He could have dwelt on the fact that his son rudely requested his inheritance. He could have, instead of bringing him back in, he could have demanded an explanation for this type of unceremonious return to the family. Think about the condition that that young man was in when he came back. When he was off in that distant land, he was considered lower than a farm animal. Do you think he was presentable when he showed up? No. But the father doesn't hesitate to cover up the filthiness of his son with the most beautiful garment. He doesn't hesitate to put shoes on his feet where presumably there were none. You can almost imagine him sliding the ring on a finger that is caked with dirt and grime. This young man had quite literally nothing to offer his father. And it didn't matter at all because this father had gotten back for himself something immeasurably precious, his very own son. And and this paints a picture for us, again, of the heart of God. And God fully restores those who return to him. And so this parable gives us this intense imagery, this palpable picture of the difference between where sin wants to lead us and where God wants to lead us. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so sin takes us down a path toward ruin. It can take us to a place where we find ourselves looking up at pigs, where we we find ourselves thinking, well, at least the pigs have food to eat. And this path of sin, it eventually leads to death. But the path that God wants wants to lead us on, that path leads to eternal life. God can lift us up no matter how low we've been. And he can restore us to full status in his family. You know, sin is enticing. It can be pleasing to the eye. But ultimately, sin is always empty. It's always destructive. And Jesus is reminding us and the Pharisees that he's addressing here that the riches of repentance far outweigh the so-called sweetness of sin. And if only that was where the parable ended. But Jesus continues, and, and we could have ended on this, this high note with this, this prodigal son who had, who had wasted his money and almost died in abject poverty. But then we see him being completely restored to his family by his unbelievably forgiving father. But Jesus continues, and we see this character reemerge that we haven't seen since the very first verse. We see the older brother the heir, the firstborn son, and Jesus gives us this twist ending. Verse 25, meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing, and so he called one of the servants, and he asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound, and so the older brother He comes into focus in this story. He was coming back in from the fields, and he hears this strange noise. He hears music and dancing. It sounds like a party, right? So naturally, he asks, hey, what are we celebrating? And the servant says, we killed the fattened calf, the fattened calf, because your brother is home, and he is safe. And any of you who have siblings in here probably know what sort of feelings that brother was feeling at the time. Like We don't even have to read the description to anticipate the type of feelings that would be bubbling up in his heart, in his mind, right? After all, he'd just come in from the field. What was he doing out there? He was working. He was working for his father and for this estate that he would one day inherit. And what was his brother off doing? Who knows what, right? Living it up. 
And here's his reaction. Verse 28, he says, the older, it says, the older brother became angry and he refused to go in. So his father went out and he pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and, and I never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. And so this older brother, he refused to go in and celebrate. He didn't want to see his brother. He didn't even want to go give him a hug. And look at the language that the older brother uses to describe his relationship with his father. And think about who Jesus might be comparing him to. He says, I've been slaving for you. He says, I have never disobeyed your orders. He says, you never gave me anything. So from his perspective, he was the responsible one. He was the one working hard to hold everything together. He was the one that had never, ever disobeyed his father from his perspective. And then he says to his dad, Dad, after all I've done for you, for you, you have given me nothing, not even a little goat to have a small party with my friends. And so we see this stark contrast between how these brothers address their father, how they come back to him. The younger brother comes to the dad with humility and asking only to be taken back as a servant. But what we see is the older brother, on the other hand, basically describing himself as a servant, even though he is the brother, the son, in good standing with his father. Look at what he says about himself. He says, I'm slaving for you. I've never disobeyed your orders. Okay? He's using servant language here, and so we can see this contrast between a servant and a son. But the older brother wasn't finished. But once he does, the father has something to say. Verse 30, it says, But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home. You kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so the, the older brother continues to complain to his dad. Like, how dare you? Bring this brother back in. He's so unworthy of this grace. But then it's dad's turn to talk. And he basically says to his son, listen, you can be a servant or you can be a son. The choice is yours. And he tells his oldest son, you've been with me all this time. Everything, everything I have is yours. You could have had as many goats as you wanted. You could have had the fattened calf. Don't you see? You've been here with me this whole time. But the older son basically chose to be a servant, not a son. So what will you choose? Will you choose to recognize that there's nothing, not a single thing that you can do to deserve God's grace and God's love and God's acceptance? Or will you work for it and demand that everybody else work for it too? So we see in this parable that there are many ways that we can separate ourselves from God. But no matter how far away from God, he's willing to take us back, no matter what condition we're in. And one of the things that I'd like for all of us to leave here with today from this passage is a new perspective on repentance. You know, it's easy to view repentance as an obligation, something that we have to do in order to be in good standing with God. But I want us to think about it the way that this parable teaches us to, and that's that God wants us to view repentance as a pathway to grace and acceptance. Not as an obligation, not as a chore, but a joyous moment that reunites us to our Father and puts us back in good standing in God's family. So the other thing that these three parables unabashedly tell us to do is to celebrate and enjoy the feast. Have you ever found yourself with the same attitude as that older brother? Have you ever cared more about others getting what they deserve, their consequences, instead of hoping and praying that they would come back to God? You know, when we, when we find ourselves hoping for God's judgment and God's wrath on others, we're basically just like that older brother refusing to go inside and celebrate. You know, he didn't realize he could have had as many parties as he wanted to. He missed out on the riches of a relationship with his father because he 
He wanted to earn everything for himself. But that's not what God wants from us. He wants us to enjoy our relationship with him each and every moment. And we know that we could always, always return to God through repentance. And that God is waiting there, waiting to rejoice with us when we return. God wants us to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the riches of repentance far surpass anything that sin could possibly offer us. And those riches, they also fuel our lives. What are those riches in our lives? The joy of God. God's peace in our heart. The fullness of the life of Christ, which lives in and through us. That's the riches that God pours out on us extravagantly, willingly, each and every day. And so, wherever you're at with the Lord today, don't choose to be a servant. Choose to be a son or a daughter And if you find yourself far off, if you find yourself separated from the riches of a relationship with God, come home. Just like that song that we sing, run to the Father again and again and again, however many times that it takes. Because God's riches are there for us to share. We're supposed to share in those riches. We're supposed to rejoice with anyone who's experiencing the riches of God. And God has enough riches for us to celebrate endlessly okay for all of us and that's not figurative language that's literal that's what we're going to be doing in heaven with god for eternity we will be celebrating with him but we don't have to wait until we get to heaven we can be united to god even now right now turning away from anything that draws us away from god and receiving the riches that come from repentance doesn't matter how far away you are doesn't matter how lost you feel May we always remember that God is overjoyed when the lost are found. Let's pray. Oh, God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this love that we can hardly comprehend. God, we can't imagine this, just this love that has no strings attached, that no matter where we are, no matter what condition we find ourselves in, you are, you are not just okay with bringing us back, but you are elated to bring us back. It it brings you more joy than anything else when we come back to you, God. We thank you that, that you shower us with your riches when we are united with you, when we repent. God, we pray that we wouldn't just, we wouldn't just hoard those riches for ourselves. God, we pray that when we look out and we see others that aren't, that aren't following you or others that have drifted from you or others that are purposely keeping you far away. God, I pray that we would not be like that older brother, unwilling to celebrate, unwilling to to hope and pray that that person would come back. I pray, God, that you would birth in our hearts this spirit of love, just like you have for us. Lord, that we would participate in this mission to bring people back to you. God, I pray for, for anyone in this room who is feeling that distance from you right now. God, anyone who has kept you at arm's length, God, I pray that you would break through whatever, they, whatever they're, they're, they're holding back. God, that, that they would come to you right now and recognize that you are elated to be reunited with them. God, we thank you for this love. We thank you that you stop at nothing when we're separated from you, that you even sent your son Jesus to die for us so that we wouldn't have to be separated from you because of our sins. God, we love you so much and we pray that we would live in this, in this love, that we would choose not to be servants, God, but that we would choose to be sons and daughters, that we wouldn't try to earn your love and your grace. We wouldn't think that we need to, to get ourselves right before we come back to you, Lord, even if we're unpresentable, We thank you, God, that you take us back. Help us to remember you are the loving Father that takes us back with no conditions. God, we love you so much, and we pray that we would take this love and and live it out in this world, being your lights to those around us. God, we love you so much, and we thank you for this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, thank you guys so much for being here today. We'll see you back here next week. Have a good one. God bless.